We recently found tiny little microscopic globules of hydrocarbons in a couple of meteorites. And these will be perfect precursors to cells. You imagine these things were falling on the Earth or anywhere else early in its history, providing ready-made little homes for organic reactions to occur in. Another way to study whether cosmic rocks delivered water and possibly life to Earth is by collecting space dust. A hundred tons of microscopic comet and asteroid material rains down on us every day. NASA's High Altitude Aircraft Program has been collecting uncontaminated cosmic dust grains in the stratosphere over 65,000 feet above Earth. The aircraft collects microscopic particles on silicon oil-coated sticky plate collectors on the wings. It's a little like paraffin wax. So the planes are flying through the stratosphere. Here's a little particle slowly drifting down. And the plane just flies up and just smacks into this paraffin and gets stuck there like a fly on a fly swatter. These high altitude experiments have revealed that interplanetary dust and the Earth are both made up of the same silicate grains that must have been present during the early solar system. So perhaps they help to deliver the building blocks for life. The high-altitude flights have prepared NASA to embark on one of its most ambitious missions. In 1981, scientists began researching how to collect actual pieces from a nearby comet named WILT-2, which was traveling within the orbit of Mars. The fundamental question we were trying to address for this mission was, did this comet WILT-2 ever have liquid water? We know it had lots of water ice, all comets do, but were they always cold? Or did they perhaps heat up inside to melt this water ice to liquid water? That's really important because once you have liquid water, then you can have things like, like life. Scientists were faced with a daunting challenge. Stage separation has occurred, and we have second stage ignition. How could the spacecraft collect untainted pieces of a comet that would be moving 10 times as fast as a speeding bullet and therefore generating tremendous heat? So imagine trying to stop a rifle bullet in mid-flight to study it without destroying the rifle bullet and without destroying you. How would you do that? That was our problem. The solution was to use aerogel a fragile porous substance made from silicon dioxide. Lighter than a cotton ball, aerogel contains thermal insulating properties that are stronger than window glass. Hello, Peter. Welcome to Old Castle Glass. Glad you could make it. NASA scientist Dr. Peter So discovered that aerogel could capture hot, fast-moving cometary particles with minimal damage. The glass you see here, the heat insulating properties of aerogel more than 100 times better than glass because glass is solid material. Aerogel mostly is air, so it doesn't conduct heat very well. So it's a better insulator. I have a piece of aerogel here, and I have some crayons I'll put on top of this aerogel. So I'm going to use a torch to demonstrate that heating this piece of aerogel will be able to insulate it so the crayon won't melt. It is burning. It's insulating it, and the crayon it's still intact, it doesn't melt. Aerogel may be a suitable thermal insulator on Earth, but would the substance hold up in space? On January 2nd, 2004, NASA's Stardust spacecraft met up with Comet Wilt 2. Upon approaching its dust cloud, or coma, 
the craft flipped open a paddle-shaped collector tray containing ice cube-sized pieces of aerogel. The plan was to capture cometary particles, moving at over 13,000 miles per hour. When the spacecraft finally returned to Earth, nervous excitement filled the air at Johnson Space Center. I was the one to pick up the tray. In fact, when I pick up in there, I was a little bit scared. Uh, what if I pick up the tray, there's nothing there? I was broken in sweat. Oh my God. When I turn around and look at it, wow, I saw about three dozen particles I could see with naked eye. It's amazing, amazing. Nice work. Look at it. Further analysis of the stardust samples may one day reveal whether Earth's water, or perhaps life, came from comets. But they've already provided insight into the striking similarities between asteroids and comets. Many particles contained abundant hydrocarbons that couldn't have formed in the cold environment where comets typically reside in the outer solar system. We have the air gel samples from the cometary tray. We mostly thought these grains would have formed out far from the sun where the comet formed. Well, we find that some of the grains in the comet must have formed right up next to the sun's surface, heated to over 1,000 degrees, I mean 2,000 degrees. After much analysis, scientists wondered, do some comets actually masquerade as asteroids? NASA's next mission would tackle that question head on. Asteroids. And comets, once thought to be very different cosmic bodies, may be more closely related than previously thought. In 2005, NASA's Deep Impact spacecraft launched a projectile into the nucleus of a comet named Temple 1. For the first time, scientists captured images of a comet's icy, muddy interior. We think that material that's underneath the comet's surface is really in a pristine state from when the comet was first formed, which could be billions of years ago. The Deep Impact mission concluded that some comets actually mimic asteroids. After a comet orbits around the sun many times, it loses its icy, gaseous components. It essentially becomes dormant, showing a dry surface that resembles a carbonaceous chondrite asteroid which contains many water-bearing minerals. We're looking at meteorites now, which we always assumed always just came from asteroids, and wondering, you know, which of these could have come from comets. What that tells us is that there are many different kinds of comets. They've all had different histories, just like asteroids have. Asteroids and comets have much more in common than just physical and chemical composition. They've both left deep scars on Earth, which have resulted in the extermination